Watch Budget 2018 with Bloomberg Quinn. Bloomberg Quint Live and you're watching Trend Spotting. I'm Navneet Saluja D'Souza. Good afternoon, Navneet. I'm Agam Akhil. And in the next 30 minutes, we deep dive into specific trends in the markets to draw our key takeaways and its implications for investors. First, the headlines. Well, it's a tepid Thursday on the last street as benchmark indices trade record levels broader markets off days high. When banking counters surge most since November after reports suggest that the government may allow foreign investors to own larger stakes in the country's lenders. And Bharti Airtel, Yes Bank, Adani Ports and Ultratech are the big earnings that you need to keep an eye out on in today's day of trade. And Bharti Infratel is a top nifty loser after third quarter profit missed analyst estimates and the company projects a very bleak future. All right, let's take a look as to what's happening with the markets. Well, we had a great opening today at record high levels. Nifty, Bank Nifty and Sensex have been trading. But there has been a bit of cool off that one is seeing. At least the benchmarks are still holding about to their gains. But Nifty has definitely come off about 30, 35 points from day's high. Sensex holding up with gains of over 300 points. And remember, it's the Bank Nifty which has been contributing to the gains that you've been seeing on Nifty and Sensex. But Bank Nifty also, if you look at the day's high, it's at about 26887 and that's too cooled off by about 100 120 points and pull up the broader markets that's where the clear picture currently lies bsc mid cap now in the red down four tenths of a percent and bsc small cap just about holding in the green with gains of two tenths of a percent and the picture is the same when it comes to the broader market indices of national stock exchange as well because the nifty mid cap 100 free float index is now trading in the red whereas the small cap index is just about holding up in the green. I want to pull up the India Volatility Index. That's the Nifty Midcap 100 Index. You can see the intraday chart, how um, the profit booking has just come in in the last uh, 5 to 10 minutes, and that's India Wix. As you can see, when the markets open gap, uh, gap up, India Wix collapsed almost 8% in the morning trade, but from there about, it's picked up steam and currently just about trading flat to positive. So, 13.9 is the mark where currently India Wix is trading. In terms of sectors, clearly it is the day for the banking stocks once once again, but besides that, the Nifty FMCG index is also doing well. Remember, HUL came out with its numbers, strong set of numbers, but the stock has cooled off from the opening high levels that one saw. HUL currently now trading in the red. This is clearly telling you there is profit booking coming on the top. And besides that, why this index is up? You've got Jubilant Foodworks, which is trading very firmly in trade, and ITC comes out with its numbers tomorrow. Ahead of that, we've seen some strong moves coming for ITC, which is trading with gains of over 2%. What's not doing well? The Nifty Metals Index has collapsed about 1.5%. And the Nifty Realty Index is trading with cuts of almost 7 tenths of a percent. And that's almost a day's low Nifty Metals Index. And Realty also trading with cuts of over 1% right now. Let's quickly pull up the contributors list and tell you which are the stocks which are contributing the most currently on Nifty. And as we've been telling you, it is the day for the banking stocks. HDFC Bank right on top contributing 26 points. HDFC contributing 16 points. Remember, both put together have almost 13 to 14 percent weightage on Nifty. I ITC contributing 14 points and LNT2 is trading in the green. What's capping the moves then on the upside? Vedanta, Infi, Bharti Infratel disappointed with the numbers and uh, we've seen the profits also falling by about 6% and Tata Steel is also trading in the red currently. But talking about the broader markets, I think that's where the froth is because second straight day of profit booking, they cannot sustain the gains that we see. Yes, but there is a pocket that stands out. It is a great day of trade for mid-cap IT companies. Uh, everyone knows we're looking at substantial gains and Mindry on account of earnings but we also have substantial gains and first source solutions which is advanced by as much as well over five five and a half percent for now uh, we also have substantial gains in emphasis up 
nearly 5%. That's followed by 8K Miles Software, that's gaining 4%. And we also have gains in Zensar Technologies, up 3.3%. So, uh, you know, and in some of these uh, stocks will announce their earnings today and tomorrow. Uh, that's where Zensar Technologies comes uh, into focus. On the losing end, we have a little bit of weakness coming in. Uh, Adani Power, Relegate Enterprises. And TV Today Network specifically in this case is looking at a little bit of uh, profit taking considering the kind of gains that we saw in yesterday's year of trade. So, uh, well, I'd say it's evenly poised, uh, but for now, even in the broader markets, it's uh, the mid-cap IT stocks which stands out. That's right, Agam. In fact, the advanced decline ratio is telling you it's just about 1 is to 1 if mm. you look at the NSE stats right now. But that's about the markets. On trend spotting today, we discuss the m and appetite for Madison Sumi as we connect with Lakshwaman Segal, vice chairman at some Vardhana Madison Group. Will the second half of FI18 be better for all cargo logistics? We asked the Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Prakash Tulsiani. And what can one expect from, from the refiners and explorers in the December quarter? We asked Sudeep Anand of IDBI Capital. Okay then, moving on to our first trend of the day. It is a period of merger and acquisitions for Madison Sumi. The company has formed a JV with Osea through its subsidiary, Samvardhana Madhasan Automotive Systems Group. Well, um, Madhasan Innovations Company will be holding a majority stake in this JV. But what's this deal all about and what are the deal dynamics? Let's ask the management. Joining us now on the phone line is the Vice Chairman uh, at Samvardhana Madhasan Group, Mr. Lakshwaman Segal. Mr. Segal, good morning to you and thanks a lot for joining us today on Bloomberg Quint. My first question is, if you could tell us more about this acquisition that you've uh, taken recently, which segment shall it cater to and what sort of value addition are you looking at? Uh, great German OEMs uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, really exciting because it um, enables us to again um, head towards our 2020 targets and open up a new vertical for us. Uh, Laksh, is there some stake that will be held by the listed company Madhusan Sumi uh, in the, the Korea unit? No, it's, this is at the group level. Uh, MSGI is, is a different vertical altogether, so it is not a part of Madhusan Sumi. It is a part of Samuel, which is the uh, group holding company. Hmm. And do you see better growth opportunities via MS Global in the commercial vehicle segment? And is it more to do with reducing dependence on the PV segment? Absolutely. So we are we are um, focused on our three CX fifteen. No customer, no component, no country should be more than fifteen percent of our business. Acquiring this business definitely helps our group towards um, a more balancing the, the the ratio out. And we are very focused on on expanding more also on the commercial side and agricultural um, equipment and and everything um, uh, in the automotive industry. So uh, while we are uh, have a larger share in the past car, but uh, we are hoping that we can expand the other portfolios as well. Can you also tell us more about the JV with Orsia Inc. and what kind of investments will be done uh, here on from by Madison Sumi? Orsia is a is a um, is an amazing startup that is uh, now uh, has been able to develop the technology for true wireless charging. Um, you know, we hear that word a lot, wireless charging, but it's kind of an abused word because it's actually um, the, the technology on the market right now is induction charging. This is a real uh, over-the-air charging. It's not induction charging. It's uh, they're one of the first companies that really have been able to demonstrate this technology. It's really exciting because we can bring these uh, features into the car. As you know, today when when you when you come into the car, you're always buying cables and stuff and putting it uh, into the you know the, the 12 volt uh, um, you know uh, lighter. Uh, socket and, and uh, charging your, your your cars with that of the USB ports. So this will eliminate all of that and just be able to, you know, as soon as you're sitting in the car, you, your, your phone will be charging. Uh, it needs a little receiver um, that needs to be put into the phone right now, but hopefully in the future the, these receivers will come in built and will make it absolutely seamless. Hmm. Laksh, then, is this JV targeted more towards wireless charging and also the electric electric vehicle segment? Well, currently it's only for uh, smaller devices like mobile phones and, and you know IoT devices. So it's kind of uh, you know adding features to the to the to the car uh, more than actually working on the car infrastructure for for charging. 
uh, it's it's not for that at the moment. Um, so we're we're looking more towards you know giving a feature content where where people can seamlessly charge their um, IoT devices and phones, uh, which is a part of our part of our life now. And it's just inside the car is the things that you look for. So again, so increasing the the the, the content per car, increasing the features, and making these uh, vehicles even more attractive. And and hopefully even in electric vehicles, this will be a very attractive feature. All right, Lakshmi, we'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining us and giving us an update on the JVs and the acquisitions from the Samvardhan Madhusudan Group. But we'll move on then. And the first half, the current fiscal has been tepid for all cargo logistics. But does the second half look any, well, any bit promising? <clears throat> Let's ask the management. Joining us right now is the Chief Operating Officer, Prakash Tulsiani of All Cargo uh, Logistics. Uh, Mr. Tulsiani, thanks for joining us. Uh, post a tepid first half, what is your outlook for the second half and FI19? We are in the business of logistics, which is integrated services, which we provide in India. We are a global player for MTO business or less than container loads. And uh, we are number one in that business in the world. The businesses we are in, specifically the MTO business, is a part of the global trade. So depending on how the global trade develops, we also participate in that. It has been a good run for MTO business in the first uh, uh, six months, that is up to September. And uh, we have performed well. We have performed better than the market. The market growth also was good. Market grew at 35 to 4% overall basis. And we grew at 12% in terms of volume. So MTO has done very well, which is a global trade. And also, if you look at the shipping rates or the freight market, that has also done well in, uh, in up to September and I would say even up to October. The freight rates were rising, they were holding firm, and there were volumes, and because of that, there was good traction in the trade. However, come November, December, we have seen the freight rates going down. They are softening a bit, but of course we have a Chinese New Year coming up. There would be surge in volumes as we look into the current few months, weeks. Sorry. So overall, very good uh, performance on our MTO business, and we continue to remain confident about you know going forward because the world trade is uh, in terms of volumes is holding is holding well. And uh, for the global business, we remain confident. In terms of India business, there has been a softening of, I would say, or rather not a complete pickup in terms of CAPEX cycle. And that is why we see that the logistics demand specifically wherever there were new you know, uh, factories or new plants coming up, that has taken some time to kick off. There were very important events that happened and those were some policy changes in India. And that is the reason I think it took time for this CAPEX cycle to build up. However, the domestic consumption remains extremely strong and we can see that also from the import volumes coming in. So the consumption drive in India is good. It remains high and that is where the logistics needs continue to grow and they are in demand. So we remain confident that since all these policy decisions which were to be done have taken place and now everything is in, uh, in, in working order and people have understood what they have to, that is the traders and uh, the business community has understood what exactly they need to do. I think coming in the few quarters, we will certainly see uh, good growth in terms of volumes coming into India, the exports rising and also there will be good demand on domestic logistics which will be for our India business. Hmm. Mr. Tilsiani, talking about the MTO segment which you highlighted and that contributes nearly 90% to your revenues, what's the kind of volume growth that you're expecting going forward, let's say in the second half? We will certainly grow higher than the market because we are in that marketplace where LCL business is a part of the world trade. So obviously as the trade grows, we also grow with that. But I can tell you that we'll grow higher than the market growth. We will grow faster and uh, we will outbeat the market as far as the growth is concerned. 
for the CFS division has been, uh, you know, weak with falling freight rates and fallen volumes. What is your outlook for this specific segment? No, uh, CFS business has got nothing to do with the freight rates. Freight rates are a component I was just mentioning about the shipping world. Uh, freight rates for us is a pass through, so it does not affect us. Neither does it affect so much in our business of uh, MTO, which is connected to the freight market. It does not because it's a pass through. And in CFS market, it's got no concern with the freight rates. It has got concerns with the volume. And the volume in India is rising. The growth, if we see at the ports, have also gone up. And this is on the back of the consumption drive in India. And also what we see is the rising exports recently. So the CFS volumes will uh, continue to grow along with the market as we see the growth in the container volumes, exim container volumes in India. Hmm. Uh, what about the outlook for your contract logistics space? Contract logistics is a game changer as far as India is concerned. And uh, we see because of the need after the GST A, and B, the consumption drive in India. Both put together, the companies, those who are supplying goods and who are distributing goods in India, have clearly come to, you know, because of the scale which has increased recently, have come to conclusion that it's better to outsource all those activities to a logistics player who is integrated, who is organized, and uh, who is amongst the top in India. And that's where, uh, our team of our share CCI, which is a part of all cargo group, plays a role. And th because of that, we see a lot of demand in the warehousing sector. Uh, what, what I mean is the warehousing demand. And uh, we have gone in and uh, contracted with large customers. We, uh, we build the warehouses, as we call it as BTS, built to suit, uh, depending on the inquiries of the clients. These are long-term contracts, and these are all geared towards having a seamless and efficient uh, log logistic solution to, to the customers. It is what the customers, our clients are looking for is their clients' experience, the customer experience. And that is what we need to enhance. And that's where all cargo logistics along with our share CCI step in and provide that credible professional uh, logistics services. Right, so to support the demand, uh, how much do you plan to increase your warehousing space by? We are going to grow very fast in this space. Uh, we, will, we will reach approximately uh, 10 million square feet by 2020, and that's our plan because this is based uh, on, on our discussions with our client, the needs of our client, the, the demand which is coming out in the market, in the, especially in the organized sector. And uh, that is where we are present. That's why we will be building few of the warehouses also in uh, very important areas. We already have uh, entire India covered, but we need to develop certain areas which are very, very important from the point of view of either uh, production or consumption. So we will have our uh, places like the new development would happen in Hyderabad, Bangalore, and Jajar. So we are working towards all these areas to develop warehousing for the need of our clients and to help them deliver uh, the logistics needs, what they have, and to ensure that they have a clear, you know, value proposition for their end customer. Hmm. Mr. Tulsiani, but what sort of capex would you require for this, if you could tell us? I would give you overall for the company, that is all cargo, we will have first the maintenance capex that we continue to have approximately 30 to 40 crores. But overall, because of this development which we have, let's say over a period of two to three years, we will have approximately 250 to 300 crores for this development that we have on hand. All right, Mr. Tulsiani, we'll leave that. Uh, thanks for joining us and giving us an outlook on all cargo logistics. Uh, we will be watching out for more developments and, of course, uh, the performance of uh, all cargo logistics as we move in. But uh, with the ongoing earnings season, one sector that has been in the key focus is the oil and gas space. With the crude on gaining spree, how will this impact players in the oil and gas space, especially giants like Reliance Industries or, for that matter, ONGC, that comes out, it's, you know, it's a 
December earnings soon. Let's get an analyst view on this. And joining us on the phone line right now is Sudeep Anand, head of institutional research at IDBI Capital. Uh, good morning, Sudeep. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, let me just uh, take an overall picture with respect to the, the rising crude prices and what that means for upstream companies like Reliance Industries and uh, ONGC. What sort of impact could it have and what levels on, on crude are you keeping an eye on which could uh, substantially change the fundamentals for some of these companies? Yeah, good morning. Uh, see, the key thing is to see, look at the broader numbers. In this quarter, your uh, crude oil price increased at about 23% year on year, while your uh, Singapore refining margins also improved by around 7.4% year on year. However, your uh, exchange rates were uh, appreciative and uh, appreciated around 4%. If you look at the uh, uh, quarter and quarter, you're from uh, point to point increase, crude oil increased by around 17%. So overall, if you look at the numbers, we expect we are expecting a very strong numbers from your upstream and uh, in, inventory gains from uh, from all the all all the refineries and your uh, uh, your uh, all the refineries and all marketing companies like your IOC, HP, BP, even Reliance, SR, Reliance, and all. So in this scenario, we uh, we believe that your ONGC's uh, net profit will increase by around 34 percent year to 58 billion. That is our expectation. And Reliance Industry is expected to report a very strong numbers once again, and we are expecting 4.3 percent increase in your net profit to around 83.7 billion. This is mainly driven by your uh, higher uh, uh, marketing habit. So, Deep, the general um, outlook is that the crude oil prices will remain firm as uh, OPEC and non-OPEC countries have extended the cut till the end of this calendar year. In light of that, just want to get a check, what sort of GRM trajectory do you see for players like Reliance Industries? So, GRM, if you look at the GRM, it has remained stable over the last three to four months. There was some kind of a disruption because of the hurricane, and that's why you led to your higher uh, GRM in, uh, in the month of uh, August, in last quarter. But that has been now normalized, and all the uh, uh, even if you look at the operating capacity, operating utilized, operating capacity of your um, uh, US refining utilization remained at around 95 percent, which was which had come down to around 78 percent. So GRM said we don't see any major major uh, deviation. We believe that your uh, your demand growth would remain at around 1.6 million barrels per day over the next two years. As uh, at the same time, your new refining capacity would be around 0.7, 0.8 million barrels per day. So so demand supply scenario will remain in favor of producers. So we expect your GRM to remain in, uh, remain in the range of around 7 to somewhere around 9 percent. $9 per barrel. Okay, Sudeep, so uh, what is your outlook and perhaps your expectations from this quarter for Reliance Industry when it comes to its pet chem segment and secondly, its refining segment? How are you viewing business for the company? So, petrochemical, because of the, all the project uh, coming concerned and uh, the company is uh, integrated in nature. So, we are expecting a very strong uh, uh, your pet chem margin of around 18.2% in this quarter, just last year's same quarter of 15.5%. At the same time, your GRM would be around $11.5 per barrel, as just last quarter of last year's import of around $10.8 per barrel. So we are expecting major growth in this uh, EBITDA number will be coming from your uh, pet chem, where we are expecting about 22% growth in your EBITDA to around 130 billion rupees. Hmm. And what sort of marketing margins are you factoring in for the oil marketing companies? So marketing margin, if you see, we are expecting some kind of softening quarter and quarter basis. So petrol and diesel marketing margin is expected to come down, and that will actually deteriorate the result for these for these uh, all three companies. Uh, but still, because of a higher inventory gain, we are expecting it to report a decent number in terms of your year on year. So, for example, IOC we are expecting about 31% growth in your bottom line. Uh, and if you look at the BPCL, we are expecting about 15% uh, uh, growth, and your HPCL also we are expecting about 26% uh, growth. Net, net if I were to ask you from this space, oil and gas space, the quarter three earnings will be good or average? So earnings should be good. Earnings should be good. And what is your top pick in this sector? So our top picks are uh, OMGC, uh, Reliance, Petronet and Gale. These four uh, stocks we are quite bullish on. 
So, so BL actually uh, it has run up significantly in recent past. So we don't see any major upside from this level. But ONGC reliance and uh, petrol at least uh, good good growth. Okay, Sadeep, uh, um, uh, just one final question on the reliance industry expectations. You know, we've spoken about pet care, we've spoken about refining. If you leave these segments aside, and uh, I'm not, uh, you know, going to talk about telecom either. Among the other segments, is there anything else that you think that could stand out for this particular quarter in terms of segments? So, other than these three segments, uh, only segment remains is your uh, oil and gas, that is upstream, where we don't see any major variation. Uh, even on the other other income side, we don't see any major major upside or downside. So, we, I mean, uh, core business will remain very strong for this. One. Okay, Sadeep, we leave it at that. note. thanks a lot for joining us today and taking us uh, through your uh, earnings expectations in the oil and gas space for the third quarter. Okay, then let's shift focus to a digital currency that has been creating a lot of waves in recent times. And I'm talking about bitcoins from record high levels to just 25% above its 100-day moving average. Now, the level which hasn't been breached since 2015. Well, with the currency, will the currency hold up this time? Let's get in Jayesh Kilnali, who has pulled up an interesting analysis. Jayesh, over to you. Thanks for that, Namneet. Uh, so first, let's have a look at what is actually plotted on the chart. So, you know, the green line represents the percentage that Bitcoin is away from the moving average. So essentially, a positive number means that it is above the moving average. And then a negative number would imply that it is below the 100-day uh, uh, day moving average. So this is the chart of last two, two and a half years. And you can see that this average, uh, the zero line, it has never been breached after 2015. So, you know, um, it, it essentially means that Bitcoin prices have never dipped below its 100-day uh, moving average uh, after 2015, which you know is considered to be an important technical uh, zone as far as technical analysis is concerned. So, you know, what has actually happened is this is how the trend of uh, uh, the chart has been. And currently, we are at about 25-26% uh, uh, away from uh, the 100-day moving average. And if I take the average of these entire numbers, the entire trend that we have, that comes out to about 35-36%, which is represented by the red line. And currently, we have dipped below that line. So, you know, mean reversion would mean that prices would have to rise from here uh, for Bitcoin. So let's go to the next chart. Uh, you know, I, I zoomed into this chart for about one year. Uh, so I, again, the top panel shows you the same thing, which is the 100-day moving average and how much it is away from that. And the below panel shows you the price. Now, you know, for better part of this chart, the blue line has been flight because, you know, see the range that we are talking about. So it starts from about 5,000 and goes right up to 20,000, right? Now, what happens is that, see the green line. It has actually taken support close to these regions, which is about 20% away or above the 100-day moving average, which means that, you know, price Prices have actually rebounded. So I'll give you instances of what has actually been the price movement when these instances have happened. So in you know July, uh, the 100-day DMA was about 20% away, and prices actually rose from 2,000 to 4,000 for the Bitcoin. If you look at the other instance from September to November, this actually rose from 20% and right, uh, went up to about 90%. 90 the prices from that time rose about $3,000 to more than $7,000. And currently, we are uh, trading very close to that level. So, you know, it would imply that if price goes above and if history is to repeat, then we could see doubling of uh, Bitcoin from current levels. <laughs> doubling of Bitcoin from current levels. That is certainly interesting. At it least did that's reach the, the, the 10,000 mark yesterday. It's yes. back above the 11,000 mark now. <laughs> well, so it certainly is. Uh, well, it's, it's just positive for those who are in, who invested in Bitcoin right now. Uh, thanks for that, Jayesh, and thanks for giving us that analysis. It's very interesting. But uh, we've run out of time completely, so we're going to wrap the show up in this edition of uh, Transporting. But don't go anywhere. Up next is Hot Money. So stay tuned in the Bloomberg Quint.